Hello and welcome. I am Professor Rashmi Raman and this is module 27 of our paper International Criminal Justice. This module is entitled Landmark Decisions of the International Criminal Court. Let us discuss the learning outcomes. In this module, you will study about the 22 cases and the nine situations which have been brought before the International Criminal Court in The Hague. You will study the first judgment of the International Criminal Court. As you know from the knowledge of foregoing modules, the International Criminal Court is the first permanent international judicial body capable of trying cases of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. It represents the most significant opportunity the world has ever had to prevent or drastically reduce the death and devastation caused by conflict. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court entered into force on 1st July 2002. A situation can be referred to the ICC by either the state party to the Rome Statute or by the United Nations Security Council. The Office of the Prosecutor can also initiate an investigation through his proprio motu powers. Four states parties of the Rome Statute have referred the situation on their territories. These are Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Central African Republic and Mali. The Security Council has referred situations in Darfur, Sudan and Libya which are non-states parties to the Rome Statute. In the situation in Uganda, the cases are the prosecutor versus Joseph Kony, Vincent Oti and Okot Odiambo and the case of the prosecutor versus Dominic Ongwin. Warrants of arrest have been issued against the top five members of the Lord's Resistance Army or the LRA. In the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the cases are the prosecutor versus Thomas Lubanga Dielo, the prosecutor versus Bosco Nitaganda, prosecutor versus Germain Katanga, and the case of the prosecutor versus Matthew Ndurjulo Chui. There are also cases of prosecutor versus Calixte Barushimana and the prosecutor versus Sylvester Mudakumura. In the cases Dilo, Katanga and Intaganda are in the custody of the International Criminal Court. Sylvester Mudakumura is still at large. In the situation in Darfur, the cases are the prosecutor versus Ahmed Mohammed Harun and Ali Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahman, the prosecutor versus Omar Hassan Ahmad Al Bashir, the prosecutor versus Bahar Idris Abu Gada, prosecutor versus Abdallah Banda Abakair, the prosecutor versus Abdel Rahim Muhammad Hussein, and Messrs Harun Kushaib. Al Bashir and Hussein, of which the four suspects remain at large. In the context of Mr. Abu Garda, he voluntarily appeared before the chambers after hearing of the confirmation of charges against him. Pre trial chamber one declined to confirm the charges. Abu Garda is not in the custody of the ICC. Let's look at now the situation in the Central African Republic. The cases under the situation in the Central African Republic. This situation was referred 
by the United Nations Security Council to the International Criminal Court in the year 2004. The cases under it are the important case of the prosecutor versus Jean-Pierre Bemba Gombo, which started before trial chamber 3 for two crimes against humanity and three charges of war crimes and committed the five suspects to trial for offences against the administration of justice allegedly committed. The trial chamber acquitted all the suspects. In the context of the situation in the Republic of Kenya, the pre-trial chamber 2 of the International Criminal Court granted the prosecution's request to open an investigation. Following the summons to appear in court, six Kenyan citizens voluntarily appeared before pre-trial chamber 2. The judges declined to confirm charges against Henry Kiprono Kosge and Muhammad Hussein Ali. Pre-trial chamber 2 confirmed the charges against William Samui Ruto, Joshua Arab Sang, Francis Kirimi Mutaura and Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta and committed them to trial. Out of these, the charges against Mutahura were withdrawn. Trial Chamber 5, noting the prosecution's withdrawal of charges against Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta, decided to terminate the proceedings in this case and to vacate the summons to appear against him. Pre-trial Chamber 2 of the ICC unsealed an arrest warrant against Walter Usapiri Barasa. This was initially issued on the 2nd of August 2013 for offences against the administration of justice consisting in corrupting or attempting to corruptly influence the witnesses before the International Criminal Court. In the context of the sixth situation, that in Libya, on the 26th of February 2011, the United Nations Security Council decided to unanimously refer the Libyan situation to the prosecutor of the ICC. Pre-trial Chamber 1 issued three warrants of arrest respectively for Muammar Abul Minyar Gaddafi, Saif al Islam Gaddafi, and Abdullah al Senussi for crimes against humanity, the counts of murder and persecution allegedly committed across Libya through the state apparatus and security forces. The case against Muammar Gaddafi was terminated on the 22nd of November. 2011 due to his death. The appeals chamber unanimously confirmed pre-trial chamber 1's decision, declaring the case against Abdullah al Senussi inadmissible before the International Criminal Court. The seventh situation is the situation in the Ivory Coast or Côte d'Ivoire. Côte d'Ivoire was not party the Rome Statute at the time of the case and accepted the jurisdiction of the court on 18th April 2003. The presidency of the court d'Ivoire reconfirmed the country's acceptance of this jurisdiction on both December 10th uh, 2010 and 3rd May 2011. On 15th February 2013, the Ivory Coast ratified the Rome Statute. Lohan Bagbo and Charles P. Goudet are accused of four counts of crimes against humanity murder, rape, other inhumane acts, or in the alternative, attempted murder and persecution for allegedly committing post electoral violence between 16th December 2010 and 12th April 2011. Charges were commenced against them on 12th June 2014 and 11th December 2014, respectively. Their trial was assigned to Trial Chamber 1. The Chamber will set the date in due course. Lohant Bagbo 
and Charles Blake Goode are in the court's custody. In the context of the Malian situation, on 16th January 2013, the Office of the Prosecutor under Fatou Ben Souda opened an investigation into alleged crimes committed on the territory of Mali since January 2012. This situation was referred to the court by the government of Mali. After conducting a preliminary examination of the situation, it was determined by the Office of the Prosecutor that there was a reasonable basis to proceed with an investigation. The situation in Mali is assigned to pre-trial chamber 2. On the 30th of May 2014, the International Criminal Tribunal Court's prosecutor received a referral from the Central African authorities regarding crimes allegedly committed on the territory of the Central African Republic. This situation is assigned to pre-trial chamber 2. On 24th September 2014, the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC announced the opening of a second investigation into the situation in the Central African Republic. After conducting an independent and comprehensive preliminary examination for the crimes allegedly committed in the Central African Republic, in 2012. Let us look at the first case of the ICC which forms a landmark judgment. This is the case of Prosecutor versus Lubanga. On 14th March 2012, Mr. Lubanga was committed, convicted of committing as co-perpetrator war crimes such as enlisting and conscripting children under the age of 15 years into the force patriotic pour la liberation du Congo and using them to participate actively in hostilities in the context of an armed conflict, not of an international character. This verdict was rendered by trial chamber one, composed of judge Adrian Fulford of the United Kingdom as presiding judge Judge Elizabeth Odio Benito from Costa Rica and Judge Rene Blattman from Bolivia. On the 10th of July 2012, Trial Chamber 1 sentenced Thomas Lubanga Diello to a total period of 14 years in imprisonment. The time he spent in the ICC's custody would be deducted from his sentence. Lubanga is currently serving his sentence at the detention centre in Skaveningen in The Hague. On the 1st of December 2014, the Appeals Chamber confirmed by majority the verdict declaring Mr. Lubanga guilty and upheld the decision sentencing him to 14 years of imprisonment. Even though the International Criminal Court as an institution is much younger than the tribunals, the ICTR and the ICTY. In its relatively short span of operation, it has rendered a large number of important precedents in understanding not only the development and codification through the Rome Statute of International Criminal Law, but has also contributed to the procedural rules and sentencing rules and the rules of interpretation of its own statute, that is the Rome Statute. Not only has the ICC a serious disadvantage by being younger than the two tribunals, its most important disadvantage is the lack of a democratic consensus in its existence. This democratic deficit is brought about by a lack of faith by the states in the existence of the ICC and in ratifying the Rome Statute. Owing to this lack of faith by states, the ICC is severely restrained in the conduct of its investigations into cases and situations. That apart, a contentious and checkered history of the appointment of prosecutors 
has further held the ICC back in pronouncing more robustly on cases than it might have done. Despite these drawbacks, the International Criminal Court continued to thrive and has fought its way out of several political impasses, including the one created by the African Union. And today, the International Criminal Court continues to exist as the one constant reminder of the success of the state's party's assembly in creating a permanent tribunal whose sole objective is the removal of impunity for international crimes. In conclusion, I would like to take you through the major lessons that you have learnt in the last three modules through the landmark cases before the ICTR, the ICTY, and now the International Criminal Court. The most important lesson that I'm sure you have noticed is procedurally. Procedurally, what does it mean when the appeals chamber is able to uphold convictions and sentences given by the trial chamber? It reifies faith in the trial justice system. This is a very important aspect of trial advocacy because as I've explained to you in the past, in international criminal law, as it is in municipal law, the trial court is the finder of fact. Very seldom does the trial court become the finder of law. The appeals court becomes the finder of law and judges the decisions given by the trial chamber to see if they are sound in law. The examples that you have seen in the cases that I have brought before you today, the ones with Akayesu, in Taganda, in Geze, uh, from the ICTR, Dusko Tadic, Mladic, Kristic, and Slobodan Milosevic from the ICTY, and the example of Thomas Lubanga's long and drawn out trial before the International Criminal Court. All of these examples serve to illustrate this point about procedural soundness in the trial advocacy system that exists in the international courts and tribunals. The second conclusion that I would like you to internalize and that I would like to underline for you from these is the progressive development of international criminal law through the process of jurisprudence of the tribunals. Now, this is a very interesting portion of international criminal law from the perspective of customary international law. You might ask if there is any precedential value to the case law given by one tribunal before another tribunal? That is a very good question. Under the Charter of the United Nations and the Statute of the International Court of Justice, there exists a rule that says that international law does not recognize the principle of stare decisis or the value of precedent. However, in practice, there appears to be a departure from this. Let me give you a quick illustration. Take the case of um, the ICTY in Tadic. Before this case came up, there had been a pronouncement from the International Court of Justice in a case known as, uh, famously known as the Nicaragua case, whose expansion is armed conflict in, in and around the territory of Nicaragua, the paramilitary forces. In the context of that case, the International Court of Justice was called upon to find out if there was effective control exercised by the United States government upon paramilitary forces in the territory of Nicaragua. As at the end of the case, it was found that the effective control test could not be established. And in another way, the United States was held responsible. But the test that came out of Nicaragua was the effective control test. Years later comes the case of Tadic. Now the Tadic decision applied the effective control test given by the Nicaragua case of the ICJ and found that the standard given by the Nicaragua test was too prohibitive, was too limited. Therefore, Judge Theodore Meron increased the ambit of the application and changed the test in Tadic to the test known as an overall control test. 
Now the overall control test requires a lower threshold to prove a causal link between the act being committed and the person to whom the act is being attributed. And thereby the jurisprudence of international criminal law and the burden upon the prosecution became lighter. Now comes in 2008 another case before the International Court of Justice. This is a case popularly known as the genocide case. In the genocide case, the International Court of Justice had two options. One, whether to uphold its own juris uh, jurisprudence from the Nicaragua case, or two, whether to bring in the Tadic expansion of the rule. Now you know, as I have told you before, that public international law does not recognize the principle of precedent. However, what the International Court of Justice did in 2008 goes against this. The International Court of Justice chose to uphold its own jurisprudence of Nicaragua and to ignore the Tadic precedent. However, subsequent cases before the ICTY and the ICTR did the opposite. That is, they ignored the Nicaragua standard and continuously applied the Tadic standard of overall control. This created a body of fragmentation in the jurisprudence of international courts and tribunals. And that is the problem that I wished to highlight for you in conclusion. At the end of the three modules, you should be aware that not only have the tribunals contributed effectively to richly augmenting and developing the jurisprudence of international criminal law across the courts, they have also complicated the rules of jurisprudence by not standing by their own precedents and therefore subsequent cases that might come before these tribunals open up um, are open to the option of forum shopping which is that parties can choose which forum they would like to go to depending on the outcome that they would like to see now this cannot be a positive development however fragmentation proves comprehensively that international criminal law as a body or as a discipline has definitely come of age and that is the most important thing I would like to underline for you, the maturity of the system. Thank you.